I did, I did, uh, if we are ready to begin with uh, Luciana and Pauline, I did want to first just say that this session is because Luciana made it happen. And as she'll tell you, she, her daughter went through this a few years ago and recently she kind of came back to the foundation and our groups with rigor and took this up and of tracing, talking to all the patients in our group who were thinking about it or starting to plan to, but also dug through the literature to identify cases one by one. And we slowly started realizing, well, actually there's several patients who've gone with SGI-ELD who've gone through BMT. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Luciana and uh, share my screen for her um, PPT, Luciana. Yeah, hi, I, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So hi, I'm Luciana and my daughter Beatrice was diagnosed with SGIA in September, 2013 in Zurich in the Spital. She was 11 years old and we are actually from Brazil. So no medication controlled her flares completely when we tried to wean off steroids. She had one MIS episode and a few sub MIS episodes as well. Skin and liver reactions, biologics and other side effects from, from steroids. So clearly the disease was progressing aggressively. In 2015, we started to talk about BMT. So some years after the diagnosis, her oxygen saturation started to drop. So diagnosis of lung and after heart involvement. She was losing life quality, feeling very sick. She was mainly just taking prednisolone at this point. It was 2017 and no other medication was available. So why we ended up deciding to go on a BMT journey? So we trusted the medical team a thousand percent and they suggested BMT. Beatrice also wanted to do the transplantation. She was around 15 years old at that point. We had no medication option and pulmonary hypertension can have also a bad outcome. So our medical team contacted Dr. Juliana Silva in the UK and the results of the BMT study she was participating were good. So our team followed the same protocol used in the study and made, that made us feel very confident knowing that other kids did and had a good outcome. Also very important for us, Dr. Gunger discussed a plan B. If allergenic transplantation didn't work, we had her blood cord stem cells stored in Brazil. We weren't an HLA match for Beatrice, but she had a good HLA match, a nine out of 10, and it was a girl from California, 26, 26 years old. Transplantation was in March, 2018, went very well. Of course, very well in BMT is not Wonderland. So hair loss, mucositis, fever, low kidney dysfunction, increase of oxygen need, morphine to calm down pain, blood transfusions, and a lot of medications to take. So we went back home in day plus 30, and almost two weeks after, she had three vertebrae compression fractures due to osteoporosis and was in a lot of pain and couldn't walk because of the pain. Also, fever came back, and we didn't know what was going on. Maybe a SGIA flare. So hospital again, three more weeks, and she started to recover. So lungs got better, no signs of pulmonary hypertension, fractures stabilized, she's using Spidiva for lungs, hormone patch, calcium vitamin D, and she's doing bisphosphonate infusions um, once a year. So now she's a happy and healthy young adult, 19 years old, who is studying biochemistry in UC San Diego. And she wants to work with research for medications for rare diseases. Thank you. Pauline. Uh, hi, uh, my name is uh, Pauline Acevedo. Uh, my daughter is Valentina, and we are from Puerto Rico. Uh, Valentina was diagnosed initially uh, in 2013 with a typical Kawasaki. Then uh, they were suspected that she had she was having familial HLH, and finally she was diagnosed at 18 months with SJIA in 2014. Her SJIA was never under control after trying several med combinations on and high dose of steroids, sorry. And after four years, we started noticing clubbing and a persistent dry cough. A year later, a bronchoscopy and a lung biopsy uh, performed at Cincinnati Children confirmed the ILD and PAP diagnosis. We went off biologics due to a suspicion of a positive uh, HLA type that was later confirmed that she was positive. 
Uh, Valentina stayed on Jax and cyclosporine, but also it was not enough to be able to reduce the steroids. So we decided on BMT mainly because uh, of not being able to get rid of the steroids and on uncontrolled SJIA. Her first BMT was performed on April 2021. Her donor was a very good one, nine out of 10 match, but unfortunately uh, her body rejected it. So for us, we needed to find a donor in a very rush mode. So the best decision for us is, was use dad as her donor, even though he was not the perfect match, he was a five out of 10. The second BMT was performed on May, 2021. And some of her complications from the BMT was uh, a central line infection. She got mucositis. Uh, she got an increased need of oxygen that put her on the ICU for three days and a mild GVHD. She stayed in the hospital for almost four months. And since the BMT, she's doing very well, mostly out of steroids, has grown almost three inches, and the clubbing is improving. What remains right now for us is a that her lungs are showing some nodules, which doctors think is infection related, and but her body is being able to handle it since she's asymptomatic. So we're watching very carefully with chest CT every two months. We don't regret our decision because right now my daughter has is looking as healthy as when she was a baby that we haven't seen that in eight years. She's more active and she definitely having a better quality of life. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, I think, um... I'll first say thank you, uh, you know, uh, and, and I don't know what else to say other than, wow, uh, the, the, the journey that you two have been through, I think, is uh, what inspired this session, um, because I know that rheumatologists like myself who, who think about and study systemic J all day long don't spend enough time thinking about uh, the opportunity for, for something that seems drastic but also is potentially curative. So I'm going to turn now uh, to Dr. Juliana Silva, who has probably among the most experienced with uh, allogenetic stem cell transplant for uh, systemic GIA, and she's going to talk to us about some of her experiences. Thank you, Dr. Silva. Hi. Can you see my slides? Yes. We can. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Lucian and Pauline, for sharing your story. It's really um, in important for us, I think, to hear that as well from your perspective. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me today to talk to you all about, um, you know, our experience with allergenic transplant for these um, very severe and refractory patients with systemic JIA. So to start with, I just wanted to, just a second, it seems that I'm not able to pass, oh, sorry, yeah, it is here. So I just wanted to start um, with, you know, our um, experience that we published a couple of years ago. And at that time, we reported um, 16 patients that underwent allotransplant from five different centers, so three um, centers from the UK, um, but also um, Cincinnati has also contributed with some patients and a center from Prague as well. Um, on the study, the median follow-up was two and a half years. Um, the majority of the patients were transplanted from match unrelated donors, and we use mostly reduced toxicity conditioning, mainly fludarabine, melphalan, and compass at that time. So the results of our study show that 12 of these patients achieved complete remission, one achieved partial remission. This is what was a very refractory patient um, when, he came for, when he came for transplant. One had active disease on winning immunosuppression, and I'll talk about this patient a little bit more later on. And two patients on this cohort died of um, transplant-related toxicity. So we then we started to follow up um, those patients after transplant for a long period of time, because one of the questions we did have was, um, is allergenic transplant um, something that can 
resulting long-term cure for the disease or, you know, not necessarily. So we didn't know at that time. Um, so today, the purpose of my talk is to, you know, just share with you some data on the long-term results of the patients that were reported a couple of years back. And I'll mainly talk about the UK experience. I come from um, Great Ormond Street Hospital in London, UK. So I'll talk about our experience and then the experience from the team in Newcastle and at UCLH. I would not be mentioning anything about the Cincinnati patients because they are here as well and they will talk to us later on about their patients. So just going through the um, GOSH patients, so we transplanted five patients. One of them died of transplant-related toxicity, but this patient had an autologous transplant before the allogenic transplant and had obviously um, been through a lot of treatment before, um, had lots of toxicity as well associated to, to all these um, treatments. Um, four out of five, then achieve complete remission initially, but we did notice that two patients relapsed post-transplant with disease. So one of them relapsed two years post-transplant with macrophage activation syndrome. He was treated at the time with high dose steroids and then went back into remission and has been on remission now eight years um, post-transplant. And we had another patient that um, relapsed 10 years after allogenic transplant, and um, she's now on treatment for arthritis as well. Um, in terms of Newcastle um, group, they did initially, and that's what we reported, um, five patients, but subsequently they done another three patients as well. So in total, they had eight patients transplanted. Um, so their results were, Two of them achieved complete remission, one of them being nine years, um, having nine years follow-up. One has achieved partial remission and three patients relapsed in their cohort. And again, they were relatively late relapses, one year, two and three years post-transplant. They also had one patient that died of um, transplant toxicity, late um, thrombotic microangiopathy. And interestingly enough, patient number 16 that I'm showing in the graph there, who had active disease on mini immunosuppression, he was later, much longer after transplant, he was diagnosed with PRG4 mutation, this syndrome, um, and he did not respond to the procedure at all. So he continued to have active disease. Um, regarding the CLH patients, so they transplanted and we reported two patients and more recently they have done another one, so three in total. All of them achieved remission. One of them six months after transplant um, dropped chimeras and had then autologous reconstitution but remain in clinical remission as well. And one is still um, very early days for us to be able to say if he's going to be in remission because two immunosuppressed post-transplant is only two months after the procedure. So in summary, um, in terms of the long-term outcomes, what we have is 16 patients transplanted with a median follow-up now of eight and a half years. In this cohort, six patients achieved complete remission of the disease two have achieved maximum um, partial remission, and one had this different diagnosis that was done after transplant and did not respond to the procedure. But interestingly, what we did see was five relapses, and those relapses were quite late relapses, ranging between one to 10 years after the procedure was done. There were also two deaths associated with transplant toxicities. So, I think in conclusion, what I would like to you know, discuss with you all here today, it is that there is still, to me at least, there are still lots of open questions in this area. Um, some of them are, for example, you know, is there a subgroup of patients with systemic JIA that will benefit more from transplant to the others? And how can we identify those patients? Um, the other, I think, that is a very important question, it is the optimal timing for transplant, because one of the things we have observed in, in, in transplanting those patients 
was that, for example, um, joint destruction does not seem to be reversible post-transplant. Um, also, patients have a lot of toxicity related to the treatment for GIA itself, and therefore they have you know, higher chances of developing complications after transplant. So would it be best, for example, to transplant a patient as soon as it's deemed to be refractory to the you know, um, first-line treatments of the disease? Um, it is still an open question. Um, so more recently, we have, I, with my colleagues, we have proposed you know, a study to do a retrospective study looking into the long-term follow-up of this cohort of patients transplanted recently um, in Europe. And obviously, I wanted to invite you know, um, everyone that is here today, if they have patients and wants to contribute with this, for us to look into how those patients are doing long term and looking even closer to the ones that had a late relapse and see if we can identify any common features of those patients and can do some more studies on those patients that had um, late relapses as well. And um, the other important thing that we also been thinking about as a group is that we do need some prospective studies looking into you know all these i think open questions we do have such as which are the subgroup of patients how can we identify this group of patients that are um, more likely to benefit from transplant nowadays these ones that we have transplant they have been the ones that the rheumatologists come to us and say we have tried all the lines of treatment and the patient does not respond has a lot of toxicity to the current treatments and we have no more choices um, but would there be any, you know, other ways to identify the, identifying these patients a little bit earlier and then transplanted them earlier? So I think we do need some prospective studies to look into that. Also to standardize transplant procedures and long-term follow-up as well, because initially, as I said, we used a lot of flu mail compass as conditioning, but more recently we have been more inclined to use fludarabine and triosulfan um, because we do get better chimeras as well when we do wonder if um, that can you know, allow patients to um, stay in remission as well. Um, so yes, that's what I wanted to talk to you today and, and have a discussion and I'm I'll be very interested to hear um, my colleagues' experience as well. And I wanted to thank, of course, my group at Great Ormond Street Hospital in, in London, but also the team from Newcastle, um, UCLA in London as well, Prague and Cincinnati that all contributed with um, patients um, that we can talk about them today here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Silva. I know uh, there's, there's plenty of questions coming, so, uh, so stay tuned. Um, but we're going to turn now to a couple pre-recorded videos um, from uh, a Swiss group that has actually transplanted a number of patients with uh, specifically SJA uh, lung disease, um, led by Drs. Uh, Elvira Kanizar, who's a rheumatologist, and Dr. Ulrike Zeihofer, and I'm apologizing for butchering their names, but they're not here to complain, um, uh, who is a uh, transplanter, both from uh, Children's University Zurich. So Coralie, can you play those videos, please? Good day to everybody. I first wanna thank the organizers and the SOGIA Foundation to inviting me to speak. My name is Elvira Canizzaro and I'm pediatric rheumatologist here in University Children's Hospital, Zurich. I will speak about the curse of two patients with systemic GIA and the indication for bone marrow transplantation. As you know well, new biologic therapies mostly offer benefits, but in some cases, they show also limitations of therapeutical treatment. I want to present shortly the curse of two patients with refractory SGIA after having exhausted all therapeutical options. Finally, chronic refractory disease, organ damages, and impossibility of tapering the steroids lead to decision or indication of bone marrow transplantation. In this slide, you see our first patient, an 11-year-old female patient with a diagnosis of systemic GIA with typical signs, and in the timeline with blue marked arrows, you see 
during the curse, all the reactivation, the persisting systemic inflammation, the recurrent mass episodes that you still have during the whole disease, the need of repeated steroid pulse therapy, the need of change every time a new therapy to get a stabilization of the disease. After two years, we discussed the first time about bone marrow transplantation. Then we also begin to start again kanakinumab, but now in a higher dosage and shorter interval like CAPS patients. Then after a light stabilization, reactivation came again. And after uh, during an hospitalization, we saw on the surveillance desaturation signs and further examination revealed the diagnosis of interstitial lung disease. So that the follow-up with not uh, um, tapering the steroids and reactivation and still signs of chronic mass, we decide to make bone marrow transplantation. Patients characteristic from the first patient you see on the left side, and the other patient, a younger patient, a male patient uh, on the right side with a similar history of disease curse of systemic GIA, who had also um, recurrent fever, skin rashes, recurrent mass episodes, splenomegaly, and persistent arthritis. He was really immobile because of the persistent persistent polyarthritis. And finally, he has two in also interstitial lung disease um, that finally leads also for the decision of bone marrow transplantation because the need of oxygen therapy. Here in summary, you see the immunosuppressive treatment from both patients and you, need, you see the spread of all immunosuppressive treatments and all therapeutic options that we give to the patient. And before starting BMT, you see still the need of combination of high doses of steroids and combination of immunosuppressive therapy. So the indication for us were limitation of therapy, steroid dependence, persistent disease activity, and long-term damages like side effects due to high steroids, growth stagnation, osteoporosis, and cataract in the first patient, chronic and recurrent mass, interstitial lung disease, as we said before, and finally also due to interstitial lung disease, pulmonary, pulmonary hypertension. What's concerning the follow-up and the outcome, you will hear about the next presentation from Dr. Zeilhofer from transplantation team. I'm so sorry not to be present online, but for any question, you can contact me. Thank you for your attention and greetings. So hello, my name is Uli Zeilhofer. I work in the Children's Hospital of Zurich, and I'm happy to share our experience in transplantation for JIA patients uh, with you. I will present two patients uh, in detail, and if there is still time, I present two other patients. So Dr. Canizaro has already presented this uh, teenager girl who developed severe pulmonary complications with her JIA. She was transferred for transplantation in 2018, our first patient with this diagnosis. Unfortunately, the donor search was quite difficult, so we only found a 9 out of 10 matched um, unrelated donor and we proceeded with this donor for the transplantation. We decided uh, to use a reduced intensity conditioning with fludarabine triosulfan and for GVHD prophylaxis we used CAMPA, cyclosporin and NMF. So the initial course was quite uneventful. The patient engrafted and had 100% donor cells on all cell lines. However, later she developed more complications. So end of April she had severe back pain and had several a vertebral bone fractures related to her osteoporosis. So we forced to reduce and stop the dexamethasone. She was started on fentanyl and on bisphosphonate infusions. But the pain was very severe and immobilizing her and she uh, was really sad and went into a profound depression. Later on, she developed a CMV reactivation leading to a macrophage activation syndrome with pancytopenia. Uh, she was again admitted to hospital required several GCSF doses and transfusions. Um, we did not want to use steroids, but increased the cyclosporin dose and could calm down the syndrome. In addition, she um, suffered from severe nausea and vomiting. As you can see on her weight chart, she had a significant weight loss and it was very difficult to treat her. And we started uh, on antidepressive treatment and even on cannabinoids to, to have something against this weight loss. 
And in the end of 2018, she finally improved. And um, so we could stop the opioids. Um, the nausea was better. Also her um, lung function test was uh, a lot better. And um, in the echocardiography, uh, there were no signs for pulmonary hypertension. And we even performed a right heart catheterization in April 2019, and there were only very mild signs for pulmonary hypertension. So the night oxygen supply could be stopped. The amlodipine was still continued. In June, she still had 100% donor cells on all cell lines. And unfortunately, the family moved to Brazil in summer 2019. But still, we did not lose her because I'm still in contact with her mom. And I know that she started a new life. She's physically very active, as you can see here on the photo. She's still on bisphosphonide infusions once per year. Her blood tests are all normal. She's fully vaccinated. The spleen is still a little bit enlarged, but um, heart and lung are still normal. And she started her studies in California. So now the second patient has always uh, also been presented by Dr. Kanizaro. And um, he also had lung complication with his JIA. Um, so for him, we found a 12 out of 12 HLA identical donor. Um, we uh, applied the same conditioning regimen as for the first patient. His course were, was more complicated in the beginning. Um, he suffered from severe nausea. It was almost impossible to feed him. He had severe mucositis, several episodes of febrile neutropenia, HH physics reactivation, but also he um, had a prompt engraftment. However, the neutrophils dropped again and he developed the E. coli sepsis. And also he developed several vertebral fractures, however, not as painful as for patient one. And then after discharge, actually more complications occurred. And um, so he had several episodes of macrophage activation syndrome. As you can see here, almost every two months we had problems and had to readmit the patient. It was very frustrating for him and um, for the family and also for us. He was treated with steroids. Uh, then we decided to start him on dexamethasone pulse therapy according to the HLH protocol, hoping that with this regimen we could prevent further macrophage activation syndromes. However, unfortunately, this was not successful. The next episode occurred in December. But at this time, we realized that after just one day of steroids, actually most of the symptoms uh, were better. And so we started a new regime. We decided to taper his immune suppression in the hope that the new immune system would would get stronger. So the tacrolimus was stopped later and also the steroids were, were weaned off uh, very slowly. So over six months, he still had some episodes of fever, headaches and cytopenia, but we have never started treatment for this again and they have always uh, resolved um, themselves. So today, um, he's also in a very good condition. His immune system is normal. His t metapoiesis is normal. However, at the last control, um, we noticed uh, a, a drop in his chimerism. And um, so we will um, check him again in three months and are a little bit worried about this. However, he's still stable. His osteoporosis has significantly improved with a cluster infusions. He's also fully vaccinated. The clubbing of his nails improved. The splenomegaly is gone. And also his lung, lung function test, as you can see here, is almost normal now. He's also physically active under regular physiotherapy. And he attends normal school, which is a big, big progress for this patient. So to summarize, um, I have shown you that two really severely affected children had a great benefit from the transplantation. Um, I hope I could show you that life-threatening conditions can improve or even resolve after transplantation. Um, the courses of the transplantation were quite complicated and we were confronted with unusual complications like this macrophage activation syndromes. And of course, there are many open questions. So which patient benefits most from transplantation? What is the best time point for transplantation? And what is the ideal conditioning regimen? We actually think that the RIC conditioning with triosophan fudrarabine is maybe not strong enough. So with this slide, I want to thank you for your attention. And if you, there is still time, I could also show two more patients just for more slides. So. This is a, a two-year-old girl, girl that was transferred from another hospital with suspected HLH um, because of recurrent macrophage activation syndrome episodes. Very difficult to control, but most of the HLH diagnoses were excluded. Um, but because the girl was so severely ill, 
uh, we agreed to go for transplantation in September 2015. We found a very well matched unrelated donor. The conditioning regimen was uh, targeted busulfan, fludarabine, and campus, H for S for H and H in our uh, center. She also developed a mass syndrome shortly after transplantation and almost one year later, a second episode where she was admitted to her local hospital for several weeks. She was on steroids also for several weeks and the steroids were very slowly weaned over six months. And then shortly after she developed the episode of JIA in both knees and ankles requiring intraarticular steroid injection. But since then, she was asymptomatic and well. And retrospectively, actually, because of this complicated course and all the genetic tests came back as negative for HLH, we think that most likely also this girl was actually transplanted for systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis. And now the most recent uh, patient, the three-year-old girl, she also had three episodes of macrophage activation syndrome and uh, steroid-dependent polyarthritis that could not be controlled with other drugs. Um, she was transferred to us end of 2020. She was transplanted with the same conditioning regimen as the first two patients. We also found a very well-matched unrelated donor. Uh, the transplantation course was quite uneventful. However, she dropped with her donor cells. So you can see here that all cell lines, CD14, 15, and also CD3, dropped around three to four months after transplantation. The arthritis was still well controlled, so we could even stop the steroids. But just two months later, she relapsed with her JIA, and again, it was very difficult to control um, her disease. So in the end, we agreed to go for a second transplantation, which has been done very recently. We changed the donor, but again, a very well-matched donor. Um, we decided to go for a more intense conditioning regimen, myeloablative busulfan, cyclophosphamide, and ATG. And the transplantation course was initially uncomplicated, but then in January, she had a generalized seizure and was diagnosed with EBV encephalitis. Uh, she was not uh, clinically very uh, sick, um, but we worried a lot because she had... Uh, um, major findings in the MRI and in the CSF. So she was treated with rituximab by site and uh, memory cells and recovered. Um, and now she's still 100% donor cells on all cell lines. The arthritis is still well controlled and we could stop again the steroids end of January. But however, we still have to wait if she will really benefit from the second transplantation. So thank you again. So unfortunately they won't be uh available for questions, but um, certainly enlightening experiences uh, and, and not easy courses. So we're going to transition now um, to um, the experience up in uh, Canada between Ottawa and Sick Kids in Toronto um, with Dr. Johannes Roth presenting. Hi, uh, thank you for allowing me to uh, join today. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, sorry. Um, so I'm going to present uh, for both myself and Dr. Wall, uh, who is uh, in charge of the transplant of this patient, and uh, any transplant requ uh, related questions should, of course, go to, to Dr. Wall. Just trying to get into presentation mode. There we go. So our patient and um, was a, a patient who presented almost um, eight years ago. Um, she had developed spiking fevers at the age of three and a half years and was then diagnosed with the classic systemic juvenile arthritis with arthritis rash and, and other features. But uh, very uh, soon after diagnosis, uh, demonstrated a significant uh, drop of cell lines, high ferritin, so features of macrophage activation syndrome and was therefore diagnosed with systemic J and MAS. She was initially treated with a combination of steroids, IVIG and Kinaret but turned out to be very treatment resistant from the get-go. We were unable to taper her prednisone, uh, increased kinaret further, added cyclosporin, and eventually switched um, a few months into the disease course from kinaret to tocilizumab, to which she developed uh, a significant infusion reaction early on. And as you can see now, of course, in hindsight, she was heading straight into that uh, course of patients that have been described with um, systemic JA associated lung disease. We switched her to canakinumab, had to use higher doses for that. And because she was so treatment resistant, we actually did extended genetic testing. So initially targeted panels came back negative, but when we did a whole exome sequencing, 
uh, and remember this is 2014 um, where actually a, a new gene was described causing um, a syndrome or a disease of uh, persistent inflammation with fever arthritis hlh and enterocolitis and uh, and of course scott was one uh, of the lead authors of those two publications so in her case we actually found uh, a variant of unknown significance in that gene and that's how i got in touch with scott and um, scott thankfully did quite a few assessments and testing to determine whether that um, variant was actually contributing but um, we were never able to show that um, uh, uh, consistently. The reason why I'm mentioning this, of course, that this was part of the decision process then also uh, for her transplant. Two years into her disease course, um, she developed clubbing. Um, and as so many other patients with this complication, she developed the clubbing without at the time overt respiratory clinical findings. And the imaging, as you can see on the right side, was almost normal. She just had these very discreet subepithelial cysts. Her echocardiogram at the time was also normal. So initially, we just monitored uh, this lung disease, which was not progressive on subsequent CTs initially. And we did not feel that we were able to uh, stop any of the biologic medications that she was on at the time. Unfortunately, a year later, she had a flare of disease activity, also a flare of her MAS following an infection. And at that point, the echocardiogram did show uh, a right ventricular strain. And as you can see, the chest CT worsened. There was significant interval progression at that point. And the lung biopsy confirmed the distinct um, subtype of pulmonary alveolar proteinosis found in these patients. We then went uh, through several other treatment trials trying to control both her systemic GA MAS activity and the progression of the lung disease, including her participating in, a, uh, in the Tadekinic Alpha trial. Um, we tried check inhibition, and um, we were actually uh, able to obtain compassionate use access to amapalumab, the interferon gamma antibody, and were allowed to use that for a prolonged period of time. But none of these treatments were able to stop uh, the progression of her lung disease and uh, calm disease activity down consi uh, consistently. And to Randy Crohn's point, uh, we did not try the combination of cyclophosphamide and rituximab in this patient. At this point, um, you know, she also was dependent on oxygen daytime and nighttime. So um, throughout that time, there was a, a difficult um, and difficult decision process to go for the uh, allogeneic transplant in her case. Um, we definitely had a patient with a complex, profound immune dysregulation. We weren't entirely sure whether there was a genetic contribution. Um, and we had, of course, a very inflamed lung that would represent a very high risk um, for a graft versus host disease and overall risk uh, for graft uh, uh, accumulation. So this decision process really involved the family first and foremost. Uh, the transplant team at Sickets, of course, rheumatology at Sickets and CHEO. Uh, it involved several other experts internationally and also our palliative care team and bioethics. This was not an easy decision. The family is present today at the presentation and has given me permission also to share some of the photos that you will see. There was no active inf uh, infection on pre-transplant bronchoscopy. We, uh, the team optimized immunosuppression and through transplant uh, decided to carry through imipalumab steroids and anakinra as part of a, a graft versus host prophylaxis and to control the under underlying inflammatory process. Uh, there was, of course, great concern for graft rejection and mixed chimerism. And um, so um, what was done here uh, was uh, peripheral blood stem cells from a 10 out of 10 matched donor. Uh, a reduced toxicity regimen was used. And then um, the uh, tacrolimus uh, with also steroids, emapalumab and kinoret, were used as a graft versus host prophylaxis. When she went uh, through transplant, she had rapid resolution of joint manifestations that had actually been quite significant pre-transplant, um, but had a worsening of her pulmonary function, perigraftment, which required temporary ventilator support and dialysis. And uh, subsequently, Kinoretta and Amapalumab were stopped after engraftment was shown. And she really took a long time 
for her recovery from this transplant. And so I just wanted to show you these two photographs just to illustrate what a burden um, this disease, but also the treatment can be on the patient and the family. Uh, this is our patient uh, celebrating both her ninth and her 10th birthday in the hospital. Her ninth birthday she celebrated because she had to be admitted, was a condition by the company to receive the emapalumab. And then her 10th birth, birthday she uh, celebrated in hospital during her transplant. But she did survive, and this is her uh, on her first uh, post-transplant anniversary. She's now 16 months post-transplant with full donor chimerism. She has a bit of a persistent thrombocytopenia. Um, three months after the transplant, she developed features of acute and chronic graft versus host disease with cerealimus actually worsening the rash, but had then interesting a quick response to raxolitinib and not a JAK inhibitor, and is currently still on raxolitinib, and there isn't a clear decision as to whether and when to end this JAK inhibition. But um, quite frankly, to our pleasant surprise, the lungs are improving very significantly. And you can see the status of these lungs pre-transplant. It's almost unbelievable to see them like this one year post-transplant. And um, her skin is clear. She has no recurrence of juvenile arthritis or graft versus host disease. She's weaning off the oxygen. She's off now for most of the day. And the clubbing is resolving and her physical endurance is also improving. I'm just showing this quickly, the SDIL-18 levels did uh, fall to normal levels after transplant. And so I want to thank uh, the patient and her family for her strength to go this uh, journey with us. And I uh, want to thank also Scott and Rafael at NIH who were really very, very important for us in uh, assessment of the patient and supporting us through all of this journey. Fabrizio, Alexi, and Vivian Sapper, and then of course the uh, team at Chio and SickKids. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Roth. Yeah, um, certainly uh, <laughs> wish we could have uh, intervened more meaningfully uh, when we first met uh, that patient. Uh, so moving right along, uh, we're going to now transition to um, a patient that was initially treated at, uh, or was treated at the hospital, for, or, or, I guess at MSKCC. Uh, so I think Dr. Prokop, who is now at Boston Children's, but was at Memorial Sloan Kettering at the time. Uh, and Dr. O'Neill, please take it away. All right, so I'm presenting on behalf of, of the whole team here. And um, apologies, I don't have imaging included because I don't have access to my, MSK Imaging and, um, and Karen can certainly answer any questions that I've left out in terms of details of the pre-transplant course. Um, but this patient um, was, it came to us at Memorial Sloan Kettering, really uh, championed by Dr. O'Neill as a candidate for transplant. So at the time he presented to us, he was five years of age, was steroid dependent, uh, SJAA. He'd been refractory to multiple lines of therapy with a course significant for MIS, MAS as well as anaphylaxis. He had hypertrophic osteoarthropathy arthropathy, as well as associated interstitial lung disease. Um, so he was initially diagnosed at 18 months of age after presenting with fever, rash, and single giant joint arthritis, and had not been able to wean substantially down on steroids when he presented in June with acute onset clubbing and had a biopsy with sort of the classic findings for this disorder with diffuse lymphocytic infiltration and um, PAP. And starting in September 2020, he was maintained on prednisone at about 1.2 milligrams per kilo per dose plus monthly um, pulses of methylpred of 500 milligrams each and cyclophosphamide monthly. And he was found to have the um, at-risk HLA-DRV1 and a candidate gene mutation in NLK. And it was right around this time that um, sort of the, the truly poor prognosis of these patients was um, being identified. So I'll focus sort of on our decisions around transplant. So our timing really was quite um, 
um, not urgent, but emergent, as he did have evolving tachypnea, as well as um, worsening findings on his CT scan with interstitial lung disease, as well as interlobular septal thickening, and new and progressing cystic changes. Um, he had a pre-transplant evaluation that identified a low-level CMV on his bronchiovalinal lavage, and his baseline inflammatory markers for ESR and ferritin um, were kind of in the best range of where they had been prior to this. And I'll get to the IO-18 levels. He had a no fully matched related or unrelated donors. And um, his mother was a set of an a 10 haploidentical CMV zero positive donor um, based on some sharing in the family. And really our center practice starting in 2020 for patients with primary immune regulatory disorders have been to use you uh, sulfanfudarabine based conditioning with a post-transplant cyclophosphamide regimen. And, this was kind of based on some of the emerging literature in the, in the PERD space. And we really had decided to embark on this approach in this patient when um, we were kind of uh, gratified that uh, the group in Paris published a report of this approach as well. And so this is the regimen we use and really the trans the challenges coming into transplant were his progressive lung disease with the possible uh, CMV. So we gave him uh, two weeks of induction plus carnet prior to starting conditioning. He developed a non-COVID coronavirus infection that delayed his admission by two weeks. And this was really in the midst of the um, second wave of the pandemic in New York. And then, um, and then really the attention point that I think is very important in terms of the post-transplant cyclophosphamide approach is to minimize immune suppression at the time of graft infusion. Um, so he received one of his pulses of steroids just prior to the start, but then we really worked to um, wean him very rapidly off prednisone. The idea here is that cyclophosphamide specifically targets infused activated T cells that can potentially recognize host based on high levels of aldehyde dehydrogenase. And if our concern is that if you have patients on significant immune suppression at this time, that those T cells won't get activated and therefore the post-transplant cyclophosphamide approach won't effectively um, limit your graft versus host disease. So he had busulfan targeted at 60 because of his lung disease, fludarabine, and ATG that's dosed um, based on NMSK and, and now in Boston based on uh, both the absolute lymphocyte count as well as weight and rituximab prior based on a high number of circulating B cells. And so this is his fever curve through his transplant course. So this is day zero. And you can see he was, um, this is uh, the cutoff here is 38 degrees. So you can see that he spent much of the uh, first two weeks of his transplant febrile. And then again, um, at the time of engraftment, developed fever again. And during this time, we had him on a minimal dose compared to what he had been on of steroids. It started, as I mentioned, the TACRO and MMF. And then starting um, just about um, several weeks after engraftment, he developed increasing respiratory distress just after, in the week after MMF was discontinued. He had a BAL that showed low level CMV, but nothing else infectious. And a CT that was had progression of um, opacity is considered likely to be infectious in nature, but not clearly infectious, obviously. Um, and he went to the PICU for respiratory distress and required high flow nasal cannula. And um, after almost a week in the PICU and after the results of the, C of the CT, we pulsed him with uh, two per kilo of steroids that were weaned relatively quickly, so over a two week period down to um, one per kilo of steroids. And he was discharged from the hospital with overnight high flow, but no longer requiring um, significant respiratory support. And in addition to um, this rapid steroid taper and the resumption of steroids. We also restarted MMF, even though he is lung disease had failed to respond to this um, prior to transplant. And one of the reasons for this was the 
change in his respiratory status over this period, but the other was um, the, the um, change in his, some of the inflammatory markers. So while we weren't able to measure IO-18 and CXCL9 in, in real time, what we did see was um, a recrudescence of his CRP, ferritin, and especially his IL-6, just as his pulmonary disease was getting worse. Um, so overall, by the time of discharge, his respiratory status has improved and he was discharged on an overnight high flow. He had GI distress and pain um, early post-transplant that resolved with steroids that we graded as uh, upper GI GVHD that has not recurred. He had generalized pain that gradually improved um, and his rash improved. His PFTs um, were not reliable based on his age, but um, if anything, improved over the course of his transplant. And his chest CT, um, the last imaging was done in January and had not only resolution of the infiltrates, but also starting to improve in terms of the subpleural and parenchymal changes as well as the septal thickening. So he's now eight months post-transplant. He was readmitted twice, once for bacteremia requiring removal of the CDC and once for a myoclonal uh, episode concerning procedure, but seizure was ruled out. He is 100% donor in all lineages. He had um, some cytopenias that resolved with adjustment of medications, uh, stopping Valgan cyclovir and restarting Gan cyclovir. He remains on Tacro MMF and has weaned steroids down to now two milligrams per day, um, which is the lowest he's ever been on. His upper GI, GVHD, resolved with steroids, and he has mild skin rash that responds to intermittent and really very intermittent topical steroids. His immune reconstitution has been slow. His CD4 uh, just hit 200 as of the past few weeks. And he remains on BAM with aggressive pulmonary toileting, but is off high flow nasal cannula. Um, and in terms of infection, he remains on gancyclovir prophylaxis as well as pentamidine and developed COVID-19 without severe disease and without requiring hospitalization, which we were very pleased with. And I think I really um, need to credit this incredible team that cared for him before, during, and after his transplant and really championed by Kieran O'Neill at HSS, um, Liz Farino, who, who was the pulmonologist involved in his care. Um, and, you know, this really took, as you saw, much of his care was delivered in, in the intensive care unit and really took a very integrated team to achieve uh, the outcome we achieved. Thank you, Dr. Prokop. Um, I will apologize and say, I am not sure whether doctors uh, Cartier and Nevin from Descartes in Paris. Yes, yes, we are here. We are, here. Are, are, you, are you planning to present or just be here for our panel? Well, I, sorry, I haven't prepared slides. So I can tell a few words about two children. One was published. So just to present, to introduce Dr. Neven and myself, we're working in Necare Hospital in Paris. She's a pediatric immunologist and I'm a pediatric rheumatologist. And so we had an experience in the past of autologous spinal transplantation in some patients with severe Stills disease as the Dutch colleagues and other colleagues had. And we are a bit disappointed to see more complications, post pediatric complications and uh, quite a lot of flares. So as all of you, we were thinking about doing some allergenic pulmonary transplantation, but we have very few patients who met the severity criteria. We had one five years ago, the girl we published, a three-year-old girl from parents who were far cousins. The mother had vitiligo. However, we had to choose the mother as a donor because there was no other donor. The child had very severe disease, but she was not one of these patients with lung involvement, as far as we could see. She just had severe systemic disease and polyarthritis that was refractory to I1 blockers, I6 blockers, a combination of NF alpha plus thalidomide, nitrotrexate, and so on. So we ended up doing a nanogenic donor transplantation. Uh, the conditional regime and Benny can discuss it, but it was uh, a MAP compact plus um, fludarabine plus. Um, Busulfan, she had uh, Busulfan, uh, yeah, and then she had a cyclophosphamide post transplant because it was a uh, outlaw uh, donors. 
uh, and uh, uh, she tolerated well the, the conditioning. She had a full donor chimerism. Uh, and then uh, she developed uh, my GVHD and uh, uh, ITP uh, one month after, uh, one year after transplant that uh, needed some uh, immunoglobulin uh, uh, treatment and then she uh, fully recovered um, that has from many GIA and, uh, autoimmunity. There are many infectious complications, including long-lasting hair cells, and many autoimmune complications, the ITP, thyroiditis, she irritated, she received the vitiligo from her mother, but after a very complex story, she ended up in the remission of the arthritis. She had just one transient knee flare at six months, it's very transient, but no evidence of activities. We are now five years from the transplant. She's doing well apart from vitiligo and split platelets are 100,000. That's no problem with this. So it's a success, but with a very complicated post bone marrow transplantation course. And I must say, we haven't yet checked again, we haven't checked again to chimerism. We have the chimerism that was, as we did say, 100% donor after the marrow transplantation, and we did not uh, plan to check it yearly or whatever. Um, and then we have another child, a three-year-old girl as well, who has a presentation with mass and very, very resistant as GIA. She resisted to everything, IL-1 blockers, tocilizumab, um, uh, uh, even baricitinib, she was able to have on a very bad SGI flare without mass, I must say. And then we had to introduce sirolimus. It's too early to know if it may have some effect. We don't feel it has a major effect. And uh, she's on imapalumab for the mass. So imapalumab is active on mass, but not on systemic GI as often, as always. So she's on high dose steroids and we have to go through a translation. She has a HLA identical donor. There is some mild interstitial lung disease, but very mild, I'm not quite sure if it's SGIA or previous COVID infection or something else, but she has very high IL-18 levels in the blood. So we feel she's part of this phenotype of young children who do not respond well to classical biologics, who are, are high risk of severe lung disease with these high IL-18 levels and this recurrent mass so if you really have to go to, for our genetic bone transplantation, and we should perform this uh, in uh, one month or so, uh, and we then can discuss the conditioning regime we aim to do, but it will be a rather classical one, I think. Thank you, uh, Dr. Scarti and, and Nevin. Um, yeah, I, I think a recurring theme of, of good outcomes, but very rocky courses. Uh, and so our last two groups, uh, I think are focused more on lung disease. Um, so I, I believe uh, Dr. Kyla Driest and Dr. Uh, Rola Abu Arja from Nationwide are going to present their experience with a uh, patient. Uh, so this is going to be a presentation of um, me and Dr. Dreis. We're going to uh, kind of tag team. Uh, so we're going to talk about allogeneic bone marrow transplant in a young patient with systemic J and MIS. Uh, so I am um, a pediatric bone marrow transplant physician, and Dr. Dreis is the pediatric rheumatologist. So she's going to start first. <laughs> Can I have it on screen share mode? So oh, there we go. Perfect. Um, so um, this patient was um, originally presented to another hospital. Um, at that time, she was 16 years old and presented with fever, rash, and arthritis. She had a diagnosis of celiac disease, which unfortunately led that to be the main thought of what was going on initially, but she was a, later diagnosed with JIA and started on prednisone and a tannercept. At that time, I did not see systemic JIA listed specifically. Um, she continued to have on and off description of rashes in the clinic notes um, that were again attributed to her known celiac disease. Um, they ended up switching to tocilizumab and then adalimumab due to continued active arthritis. She then developed, had multiple admissions for fever that were treated as infections with antibiotics and holding of her biologic therapies. It wasn't until her fourth admission for fever and that was her second ICU stay uh, five months after her first admission that she was diagnosed with macrophage activation syndrome. After the MAS diagnosis, she was switched to cyclosporin and canukinumab. And at that time she moved and transferred um, to our hospital when she attended college. Um, we did end up discontinuing the cyclosporin. It really didn't seem to be helping her symptoms at all. Um, she had a lot of side effects and she had definitely had active arthritis still. Um, she had had prior problems with methotrexate, so we didn't start with that, but we did add leflunamide 
Um, later, we added hydroxychloroquine because she continued to have um, difficulty in weaning steroids. Her canukinumab was increased over time to 300 milligrams Q4 weeks and 500 milligrams Q4 weeks due to what we felt was more smoldering MAS. Every time we tried to decrease her steroids, the ferritin would creep back up again. Um, we really struggled to, to wean. Um, she did develop some mild dyspnea on the exertion, mostly with stairs. Um, at that time, PFTs were performed and she did have a low DLCO with some mild obstruction pattern, but her chest CT was normal and her echocardiogram was normal at that time. She then was admitted with a very severe flare of MAS and really her body just laughed at steroids. Um, we gave her solumedule, gram a day IV and her ferritin was doubling daily, was over 15,000 after a few days. We switched to IV anakinra Q6 hours, added IVIG, added tacrolimus. Eventually she was able to be discharged home on anakinra sub QTID, dexamethasone, IVIG and tacrolimus after 16 day admission. And after this flare is when we first began the discussion of a possible bone marrow transplant. Um, and the thought for the bone marrow transplant was this recurrent refractory MAS. It was a little bit scary how little her body responded to steroids um, during that, that last admission. Um, she had pretty poor quality of life at that point and was on persistent prednisone for three, four years at that time, despite pretty aggressive immunosuppression. But then uh, when we ended up seeing her on the bone marrow transplant service, um, we discussed the transplant option and um, we ended up moving forward with an allogeneic bone marrow transplant from a 30 year old 10 out of 10 match unrelated donor. Of note, she did have a match to link donor actually available, but and we did genetic evaluation that didn't show any mutations, but uh, the patient did not want her sister to be her donor given that she had similar symptoms and we were kind of afraid that she's developing um, the same disease. Uh, the donor CMV status was positive. Uh, she received bone marrow uh, and her cell count was um, very good. She uh, received nine, almost 10 million uh, CD34 per kilo of um, uh, cell count in her marrow. Uh, there was some uh, blood group discrepancy and she ended up receiving a reduced intensity conditioning regimen. So our standard conditioning regimen nationwide children's is uh, the immediate uh, alentuzumab with uh, um, uh, fludarabine and melphalan uh, with a dose of 0.3 per kilo per dose times three for the, for the alentuzumab and uh, fludarabine, the standard 30 milligram times five and the melphalan 70 times two. Her graft versus host disease prophylaxis, um, we continued to tackle Lima, so she was actually receiving pre-transplant and we started on methyl pred, one per kilo per day um, for about one month after transplant. And then we tapered that, um, we, we attempted to taper that um, after. Uh, she, she We continued anakinra um, pre-transplant and uh, post-transplant until she engrafted to try to prevent and an MAS episode post-transplant and hydrochloroquine was discontinued right before conditioning. Uh, so she had a actually very um, good transplant course. She engrafted at day nine and her platelets engrafted at day 22, but she was discharged only two weeks after transplant. So her whole admission was about one month. She had only grade two mucositis, continued to eat throughout the transplant, did not, need, did not really need any um, uh, TPN or PCA. On, uh, narcotics. She um, um, did well and her chimerisms remained between 99 to 100% at her last check of two years. She did have in the first, her main complication had a stage one grade one skin graft versus host disease that was just treated with tropical steroid therapy. Uh, but her main uh, complication in the first year was EBD reactivation up to like 40,000 when um, before, around the day 100, she received rituximab, which caused her to have B-cell aplasia for about a year and needing IVIG replacement therapy. Um, her tacrolimus was, we were able to wean that off at uh, six months, um, but the prednisone, we had issues with trying to wean her off. She had been on prednisone for about four years before she came to us on and off. Um, at the time when she was transplanted, she was 20 years old and she has been on prednisone basically since she was 16. So it was really difficult to, and we, initially we didn't realize like every time we taper, she has kind of random uh, non-significant, non-specific like, symptoms and then eventually diagnosed with um, adrenal insufficiency. 
So uh, she was diagnosed with secondary adrenal insufficiency due to her prolonged use of steroid, and we even switched her to hydrocortisone that also required a really long taper that she's finally off of it as of now. Um, in addition to that, her slow immune reconstitution, primarily because of her being on steroid for a long time, and also the fact that she received rituximab and caused the B cell aplasia. So she required to be on IVIG prophylaxis uh, replacement for at least um, two years, and um, all her prophylaxis medications were eventually stopped two years, which normally for other transplant patients, they're stopped before the one year. She did have one admission, two admissions throughout her, uh, after her transplant, one for a strep pneumonia infection, um, and the other one was uh, for chronic sinusitis. She was eventually now immunized and had full response to all her immunizations. So at her last follow-up, we just saw her. Um, she's three and a half years now post-BMT. Her DLCO and her respiratory improves um, markedly and her respiratory symptoms completely resolved. Uh, she has complete resolution of her arthritis. Basically, that was like within the 100 days after transplant, she, her arthritis completely resolved. She's now off immune suppression, she's off hydrocortisone and her secondary AI resolved. Uh, and she has full immune reconstitution now. Uh, and off note, her celiac disease also resolved. Um, so, which was a good thing. <laughs> This is a discussion from our patient. Uh, one thought was, is there a window of opportunity in these patients? I know we talk about that in rheumatology a lot. Um, you know, her initial course, um, I feel like there was maybe some delay in diagnosis and recognition of her symptoms. Um, and did this, you know, help create the system, system where we were um, kind of um, struggling to treat her disease? Are we sometimes overconfident in our ability to find the right medication combination? Um, I think in today's day and age, we have such great biologics. We have new drugs coming down the pipe all the time. And I know for us, it was just very tempting to go up and up on doses, to add medications, um, feeling like you know just one more medicine is gonna do this for us, um, but we were still struggling. Um, we did continue anakinra until engraftment in hopes of preventing MAS. Um, and I know that's not necessarily standard, although it seems like many of these patients have had that and just discussing whether that should be consideration in similar patients. And then kind of echoing earlier comments of should there be guidelines on when and who to transplant to help us make these decisions. And then just one last, I want to end on a good note from our transplant. Um, I remember early on in our discussion, um, she said that she hadn't planned for her future because she didn't think she would live to see 30. Um, and after transplant, I asked her how she felt and she said she was planning for her future. Um, she's now engaged, she's working in her chosen field and she's doing great. Another rocky but happy ending. All right, rounding out this, uh, this uh, really dense session, um, and I'm trying to wrap my head around, is uh, the group from Cincinnati. And I think Grant Schulert will be presenting. Um, so everybody, please start gathering your questions for this group. Um, OK, well, uh, thank you very much for um, putting together this great session. And I'm learning a lot from the experiences of uh, many of my colleagues across the world. Um, I'm going to talk about a patient uh, that we have uh, transplanted here. Um, we being not me, um, we being um, primarily Rebecca Marsh and her colleagues in the BMT Immunology HLH program. Um, so the big disclaimer being I'm not a transplanter um, and can't really talk in a very sophisticated way a lot of, about a lot of the peritransplant management. That being said, um, so here's a little bit on just the pre-transplant course of this child. Um, she was diagnosed at the age of 10 months, um, had a, a evanescent rash, a quotidian fever, um, had some finger peeling and coronary changes that led to an initial diagnosis of Kawasaki, um, but failed to improve despite IVIG times two, um, had a subsequent MAS episode, um, and several months later developed some limping and possible arthritis and was diagnosed at that point with uh, presumed systemic JIA. Um, initially, had started on steroids and cyclosporin around the time of that MAS episode, unable to wean steroids. Um, at age uh, almost three, started on tocilizumab, um, however, had a, an effusion reaction after the third dose. Um, about a year or so later, was started on canikinumab with initially an excellent clinical response, um, but um, missed a number of doses due to infections and was unable to fully wean off steroids. Um, after about nine months on the tocilizumab, had had a couple of episodes of possible pneumonia, developed cough, was noted to have clubbing, was noted to have findings, uh, abnormal findings on a chest CT. Um, again, during this time, Kenny Kinnab had been 
frequently held due to infection would often flare uh, when that was uh, uh, during when the medicine was held. Um, did have a further overt MAS episode that was triggered by uh, a TB infection. Um, had a lung biopsy that confirmed lung disease with a PAP ELP picture. Um, around age seven, um, due to failure to control the underlying disease, um, uh, kinikinumab was stopped, was started on tofacidinib, uh, along with continued cyclosporin and steroids. Um, however, again, the systemic features of the disease could never be fully controlled and unable to wean steroids. Uh, and after more than a year of off biologics, um, the lung disease was basically unchanged. Um, the CT was, again, showing pretty similar patterns, um, uh, as well as having some worsening overnight hypoxia. Um, so it was decided to be evaluated uh, by my colleagues for BMT due to refractory systemic JIA, this sort of worsening lung disease, recurrent MAS with uh, uh, medication wean, chronic steroid dependence and drug toxicity, including growth failure, hypertension requiring multiple medications, and hirsutism from the steroids as well as the cyclosporin. Um, so um, her bone marrow course um, per uh, Dr. Marsh, um, uh, initially um, underwent a, uh, a regimen that they use for their HLH patients, uh, as noted here. Um, got a donor from a 10 out of 10 matched unrelated donor, um, which was uh, depleted um, from TCRAB CD19 um, to try to reduce the, G, uh, to avoid cyclosporine GBHD prophylaxis, given how poorly she'd done in cyclosporine in the past. Um, initially did well, um, had um, gr engraftment around day 13, however, had an acute graft rejection about a month after transplant. Ultimately had to be re-transplanted, um, this time with a uh, parental, haploidentical parental donor, um, uh, had prep with ATG and fludarabine at that time, post-transplant management as you see there. Um, and did well, um, had a donor chimerism of about 97%, did have some low-grade skin GVHD that responded well to steroids, um, and is now uh, doing well about seven months later, um, basically off immune suppression without any major complications, and is beginning to grow. Um, less Cushingoid, less clubbing, increased energy, running around on the beach per parents. Um, and this is, Rebecca pulled this together, um, the IL-18 um, measurements um, pre-transplant, which had been sort of persistently high, you can see in sort of the uh, 30 to 70,000 range pre-transplant, began to go down, but then jumped back up around the time of the, um, the transplant course, went down again when they rejected, went back up, um, and then uh, has now actually normalized with the last one being less than 500 about seven months after transplant. Um, and I believe that is the last slide. So um, uh, overall, again, a little bit of a rocky course with rejecting uh, a matched unrelated donor, but, um, but a good outcome with the, with the retransplant uh, and now sort of a normalization of uh, all of our really systemic inflammatory labs, including IL-18, S100 proteins, ferritin, um, off, uh, off really all medicines for uh, specifically for the SJA. Um, the, the group from, uh, from uh, Great Ormond Street mentioned that we had a couple of patients uh, in, of Rebecca's in their series who'd gotten transplant in the past. Those were primarily for recurrent MAS. Um, who had, you know, basically sort of phenotypically were almost familial HLH, but had normal genetics. Um, both of those at last follow-up that I've heard are doing well um, uh, off, uh, off any treatment. So, so thanks to uh, all of our speakers. Um, that was so much to take in. And I think, um, you know, one of the things I'm struck by is, you know, the, the, the experience from Great Ormond was, was in some ways a little cautionary. Um, and then, you know, we're getting all of these individual reports that, that all have these happy endings. And so, you know, there, there could be the gestalt of your cherry picking and only telling us about the cases that did well, but I, I don't believe that any of you would do that. And so, um, you know, I guess the, the first question while we're waiting for, for folks to pipe up and people can either put questions in, um, in the chat or, or raise their hands and, and, we, and then unmute themselves. Um, 
you know, how has the, the process, uh, you know, allo transplant for immune dysregulation diseases is uh, a moving target and it's something that's done very differently across different institutions. And so, um, you know, are there things that you feel like have evolved over time that have made transplant more successful or lessons that you've learned that would, uh, you know, potentially improve transplant outcomes uh, in the future? One of them, you know, I saw in the chat was uh, potentially intervening sooner rather than after patients have accumulated a bunch of immunopathology, um, which I think is, is, you know, always a retrospective uh, uh, assessment. And unfortunately, we're not going to have the data to say how patients that were comparable would do with and without transplant. And as you can see, these patients uh, are all so unique that, that intercomparing them is, is pretty challenging. So back to the panel, things that have changed in the field or things that you would do differently? I think we're talking about, excuse me, two separate groups of patients. We have the ones who are steroid requiring in a multiple immunosuppressive drugs and nothing we can do gets them off steroids and their quality of life is terrible and at risk of infections, et cetera. And then there's this unfortunate group that many of us have transplanted who have terrible lung disease. And I think I was, to be perfectly honest, not in favor of the transplant, although the family was, I think, more enthusiastic. But then we started talking about lung transplant, which I actually think is a very not well-tolerated procedure. And for, at that point, then it really was worth considering whether or not we would be able to arrest his lung disease by resetting his immune system. He may very well flare again at some point. I think the first presentation was, very notable. But if we think that his lung disease happened in the setting of really crazy active disease at the beginning, cytokine blockage with IL-1 and IL-6 inhibitors, I wouldn't do that again. So I think, you know, for us, it really was less about general disease control and more about seeing whether we could stop his lungs from falling apart. And that we've done and we'll just have to see how things go. It was rough. Dr. Silva has her hand raised. Yes, I guess I have a, a question for the rheumatologist um, here. I was quite interested in hearing what um, the team from Canada uh, commented about the use of roxidinib um, on the patient with lung disease because you know, one wonders if, you know, the improvement of the lung disease was, you can credit that to transplant or to the ruxolitinib itself, because the reason why I ask is because more and more people have been using ruxolitinib in lung disease for primary immunodeficiencies like CTL4 and other, and other diseases, and they do have a good response. So, my question to the rheumatology team is that do, have you tried using ruxolitinib before transplanting these patients with um, lung disease? Yes, that, that's one question I have. Um, and, and then secondly, you know, to me, it's not difficult to, to understand exactly which one contributes more to the other. And another thing I wanted to comment is um, Mario is here, Mario Abinon is here, and he, you know, he, he's a guru on the, the transplant for autoimmune diseases. He'll be able to tell us more about that. But one of the things that we, we have learned um, on these patients we've reported in the past is that the chimeras miss does not seem to be so much associated with the um, stable disease uh, or relapse. So we did have a few patients that had 100% chimerism and did relapse after transplant and some that um, had autologous reconstitution and then continued to be in remission. So I think there's more to it that we probably need to, you know, investigate a little bit further. So then you're welcome to, to answer as well. well I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be polite. You know me, I, I like to talk a lot. The um, but uh, our patient had failed JAK inhibitor prior to transplant. Jonas had done masterful management. And the reason that we are continuing on the ruxolitinib is to be honest with you, we're scared to stop it. And, and you know, I, I don't want to test to see whether her lungs get worse or not. You know, she's, she's had such a beautiful response. 
Um, but um, it just since, you know, the, in this august group here, you know, the fascinating part for us was we started Sirolimus when with a very atypical rash for GVH. And it, that rash exploded. Like, it's like we fed it with the Sirolimus. And we stopped it and, and went to our next line with the Ruxolitinib and the rash melted. Like, you know, you know she, you know, like it was, it's very rare with, when we're treating, you know, you know um, the GVH rashes that have some, you know, thickening with them, they're more early chronic for, you know, just that kind of um, flip-flop. So we're very humbled with this transplant. And, and, and so our, our overall strategy, and we're feeling the way just from listening between the lines to everybody, um, our, our, our thinking is that cool down the inflammation pre-transplant. And, and, and that that's a big part. And, and then our style, style, and I'm emphasizing style, is to continue that through as part of our GVH prophylaxis. And, and so that, you know, that, that's what we're doing. But you know, my biggest fear, here, if I may just get my question in here, is, is that we're not treating the same diseases here. And, and so I don't think any two of the patients we described have the same driver mutation, the same body response to inflammation. And so that's gonna make it very, very difficult to come up with guidelines. So with that, I'll... And I, I may just add one sentence then saying that, yes, we did use check inhibition previous, prior to the transplant, but it was a different check inhibitor. And you know, even with other HLH patients, we sometimes wonder whether there are differences between the check inhibitors in control of HLH. And we're using increasingly roxalitinib now in, in other patients just for HLH MAS. But I think it's also fair to say that she seemed to have needed the transplant. Like even if the roxalitinib is part of improving her lungs, it seems like it may have needed a transplant to enable it to do so. Uh, and then beyond that, I, I concur completely with what Donna has said about the heterogeneity. So, so we're gonna to get to a few questions. I'm gonna to go to the chat. I see your hand up, Lujana. Um, yeah. So many of you are aware of this risk allele uh, that's been associated with uh, severe outcomes in systemic GIA, HLA, DRB1, STAR15. Um, you know, obviously this was just described within the last year, but are folks, you know, uh, matching for or against that going forward or too soon? Who knows? Silence is golden. All right. I would say, uh, so I can, I can address that because, you know, I, I think we would still in general select a fully matched donor over a mismatched donor. But in the setting of, for instance, a haplo transplant where you can um, do that. So A, we don't know whether it matters what the lung is expressing, right, in the, in the setting of bad lung disease or the hematopoietic system. Um, you may make things worse being mismatched between the two, but, but by the same token, in the haploidentical transplant setting, other things being equal, you can select against it. But I do think, and just to, my one other point in the ring here is in terms of timing, I, I think part of the discussion from the transplant perspective is always how good your donor options are. And so I think if you're, if you're starting to ask a question about, is this patient a good transplant candidate now? Should we be trying other agents? You know, at what point are they a good transplant candidate? Knowing what your donor options are doesn't, doesn't hurt. It doesn't commit you to transplant. Right. Yeah, and, and we've certainly gone down that route a, a few times. Um, so Peter Nigrovic asks, um, long-term morbidity, you know, we, we've heard a bit about rocky courses with GVHD that have been handled expertly uh, and mostly with good success, but long-term morbidity after transplant, particularly secondary malignancies? Probably too soon. Um, all right, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I, I think Donna can address this better than I can, but I, I think with the regimens we're using now in the absence of severe chronic graft versus host disease, I, I don't think that's a reason not to transplant. Yeah, I don't think there's been a signal yet of second malignancies in the kids with inflammatory disorders as a bigger group. Um, um, all right, so Luciana, you had a question? 
No, I was just going to add what Donna said. Just, just my experience about being like calming down the, the immune system before the BMT. For Beatrice, what happened is that she had an anaphylactic reaction to a slumidrol infusion like just before BMT, like two or three weeks. And we were forced to go to dexamethasone. So she was taking pills of dexamethasone. And that really calmed down her system. And it was like CRP was kind of low just before, and all the other markers were lower. But then we had quite a few side effects because of DEXA, but it was good to go to BMT with, uh, with the, the immune system really down from the systemic perspective. But it was kind of a bad and luck, you know, an athletic reaction then forced you to, to go to another, to another medication. So, so, so oh, go ahead, please, Kelly. Uh, from our perspective, I know that um, when we made the decision that bone marrow transplant was something we were strongly considering, um, we did wean steroids, but we didn't go below the threshold that we'd seen her flare in the past. We didn't want to anger anything. So for her, if we kept her above 20, she tended to do pretty well. And if we went below that, that's when we started to see flares. So keeping things kind of in check as well as we could, knowing that that was sort of the, the plan moving forward. Um, I will say I didn't talk before, but we had a very mature young adult that was part of our discussion. And she honestly drove some of what we, some of the plans and decision-making. When we brought up bone marrow transplant, she did her own <laughs> just research on it and she wanted to go forward. And, and she's just a very uh, mature young woman. And I think that made a big difference too in her outcomes too, because she just followed every single, all the guidelines <laughs> that Dr. Abu Arja brought up. Um, so, you know, I think that was helpful for her too. So Grant, I see your hand up. I'm going to go to the chat first and then you're on deck. So, you know, the small elephant in the room, we addressed the larger one earlier is, uh, autologous transplant. Um, you know, uh, and there's been a few series, uh, one at least, uh, suggesting that outcomes really weren't great. Um, but certainly in easier conditioning. So, you know, was that part of the consideration for any of your patients? Yes, one of the things we had seen at GOS, we had done quite a lot of um, autologous transplant in the past, but um, most of the patients had relapsed a couple of years after, um, and some did not go in remission. So that was, yes, um, you know, that, that was, it was not enough. And then we started this transplanting with allogenic after the autologous when they relapse and then obviously the patient just acquired more and more toxicity so nowadays we just discuss you know going straight to allogenic transplants and if i may i think this is a difference between pediatrics and adults so pediatrics more likely to have you know something inherited as part of the background as opposed to adults maybe the reset of the immune system may be enough yeah, although I will say there's no no shortage of sequencing efforts in this patient population, um, and and I'm sure all of these patients were sequenced to the hilt. Uh, all right, so Dr. Schuler, um, I hold on one second. I'm, Rebecca is rounding but texting me. Um, uh, we're going to skip you and go with. Dr. Yeah, no, 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 no. no. I was just uh, I asked her the secondary malignancy question, and she said, "Yeah, it's a risk." So it's not super helpful, but. Um, so, um, yeah, I think we, we're having this discussion exactly about when should we start thinking about bone marrow transplant. Um, our patient, um, it was, you know, the lungs were in relatively good shape. They were not getting better. They were maybe getting a little bit worse, but really wasn't having significant hypoxia. At the time of transplant, it was more medication toxicity, overall refractory nature of the disease that was driving the transplant decision. The, we, again, we have another patient now, we're moving towards transplant imminently, who has very bad lungs, and we're very concerned about how they're gonna do during transplant um, from a respiratory perspective. So um, the point that somebody had made about it's easy to type these people, and then you kind of know sort of if you have a, a great 10 out of 10 match and related options, or if you don't, um, or what the parent uh, types look like or any sibling types, I think we're moving to that, you know, earlier. And, you know, if people, you know, they aren't responding, and they've, all of them have basically failed uh, one IL-6 therapy. If they aren't having a good response to JAK inhibitors, we're starting to think of some of these more 
you know, more uh, commando regimens with more risk of, of toxicity, then they should probably see one of my BMT colleagues to at least have that conversation. Um, and we're trying to start protocolizing that with our rare lung disease partners uh, along with our clinic. Yeah, thanks for that. And, and good to know that uh, even Cincinnati's struggling. So um, I'm going to invite Dr. I, I struggle a lot. Yeah, we know. I'm, I'm going to invite Dr. Fabrizio De Benedetti to expound on a, a, a thing I, I somewhat agree with, which is that many of these patients, especially those with recurrent MAS, um, are actually of the same disease spectrum, uh, just simply with different degrees and, and different organ involvements. So, Dr. De Benedetti, do you have anything more to add to that? Now, there was a comment about the heterogeneity of this population. It doesn't look to me that it's really heterogeneous from, from our perspective of rheumatologists treating SJA. So I agree with you, Scott. They look to me in the, most of them are in the field of interleukinatinopathies, if I can say it properly. And they look to me pretty heterogeneous. The point is that most of the conditioning regimen were similar, but not exactly the same. If you try to put together something that makes sense, to most of us based on experience and good common sense in transplanting. That's not for me. I have no experience. I, we have some experience in transplanting as well. Right. Not as much as I've, I've heard today. Great section, by the way. Uh, so, so I'm going to move. Um, Dr. Uh, so Mario had his hand up, I saw, but he just, there he is. Dr. Abunin, please. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for a great, a great presentation. Presentations. So, uh, just a few things. I would agree with Donna about getting the inflammation down before transplant as much as you can, because this is the the the, the utmost problems that we are seeing during the transplant are inflammatory related problems, and they might might as well um, uh, affect the later uh, on development. The second thing is that um, it, it the, the whole issue of transplanting juvenile arthritis patients is reminding me of mid 80s when he had a, a, a diagnosis of severe combined immune deficiency there was adenosine deaminase deficiency there was autosomal recessive ones and the others nowadays we know more or less around 100 different genes that can cause severe combined or combined immune deficiency and we are trying to target our treatment uh, towards those gene uh, mutations and and their effects so i think by learning um, uh, by each of these patients, I think we are we are gaining. So I would really uh, like and invite people to publish as much as they can so that we can improve the guidelines. Someone was asking about the guidelines. Yes, there are European bone marrow transplant group, group guidelines from 2012 and 2019, uh, but they are uh, very, uh, dare I say, conservative, saying that if everything again fails, then you should think about moving into a autologous uh, scenario or, or allogeneic. In regards to autologous transplants, uh, we've learned uh, as well that uh, macrophage activation was a major problem at the very beginning. Then by reducing inflammation, uh, we can get that in control. And the Dutch group, uh, uh, they're doing some really fascinating research about immune reconstitution and hopefully uh, that will tell us a little bit more about the role of autologous transplant. I don't think we are completely out of autologous yet, but we still have to get more data. And then the fascinating thing, uh, which is to me somewhat devastating, is that uh, the whole donor chimerism in, in juvenile arthritis patients uh, does not mean a uh, uh, cure of the disease, which is something fascinating. And there was a paper earlier last year uh, by Richard Bird's group about Crohn's disease uh, and allogeneic transplant, uh, which uh, some of those patients uh, achieved complete uh, remission for five years without any evidence of donor chimerism in, in lymphoid uh, 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 cells. So are we talking about some other cells that might be relevant in these uh, disorders? I think we... we we have to learn a lot uh, as we go. And again, I would really invite everyone to publish these case reports because only by publishing data, we can get evidence and then make some further conclusions about it. Thank you, Dr. Abunin. That's, that's sage advice. Um, 
So uh, there's a question from a parent, and I think we should take that. So uh, this is from Ann Carlson, Anna Carlson, excuse me, that, you know, what are the things that parents and physicians should be worried about that are going to, you know, uh, you'll miss your opportunity to do transplant? And, and I think Dr. O'Neill pointed at this, that, you know, her patient's lungs were getting so bad that, um, you know, at a certain point, patients become no longer transplant candidates. So sorry to rephrase the question. What are the things that, you know, as we're managing these patients, um, you know, we should be keyed on, um, you know, to my mind, liver, liver function, especially synthetic function, uh, lung function, but what, what are the things that are going to put you out of uh, eligibility for uh, allotransplant? This is, um, I can answer that. If, uh, so I think from, from, a, from a transplant perspective, I mean, having a patient come to us with the least amount of comorbidities is ideal. So, you know, just touching on, like agreeing with everybody's comment about, I mean, referring this patient early to us so we can figure out like their donor status and kind of manage and follow along with the rheumatologist to see when is, if the time is needed and when they are so that we can kind of look at their comorbidities and, um, and watch and, give the timing, you know, help figure out that timing. Cause I think, you know, being a patient on steroid for four years or being in all immune suppression, infections, lung disease, all these other things um, will definitely make your transplant higher risk and high risk for mortality and high risk for rejection or, or um, side effects. One other thing I just wanted to point out too, with the newer um, haplo transplant um, uh, I, you know, platforms that are happening and, you know, using alpha beta T cell depletion and for haplo and match related donors, the outcomes of transplant um, complications and all these things that we've seen in those patients will hopefully be a lot less like moving forward if the patient comes in with a better uh, pre-transplant um, organ function. Um, so that's just something we use here at National Children. We didn't use it for the MIS patients, but we have it open for a lot, for all the other non-malignant diseases and malignant diseases. And we've seen such great outcome. These patients didn't need any immune suppression post-transplant. They engraft really quickly. So it's something to consider moving forward. Hey, and this is Rebecca Marsh. I'm so sorry. I'm late to the meeting. I'm sorry to have missed the conference this morning. And I just wanted to reiter reiterate, I completely agree with all of that. Um, it's really the biggest kind of hard stops are pulmonary function and heart function. Um, so if your pulmonary function has become very severe, um, if your heart function, your ejection fraction is very extremely poor, you can go through transplant on oxygen. You can go through plant transplant tracheostomy dependent with reasonable ventilator settings, this sort of thing, and even depressed heart function. But at some point, you know, a transplant team will sort of decide that the risk is just too risky. Um, and patients with, you know, very severe organ compromise. Anna, do you want to comment maybe on the lung? Because the interesting thing, and that was surprising to me from a rheumatology perspective, is how how reversible the very advanced lung disease was in our patient, right? I, I always admired Donna for being willing to take on our patient for transplant. So, So this is an interesting aspect here that, we don't fully understand what that lung disease means, how much of it is fibrotic, how much is uh, inflammatory. So, so it's very, very difficult to actually answer that question, I think. And then the other moment is it, some of these patients may have very, very impressive biopsy findings in the lungs, but functionally they're doing well. Maybe just sort of a little, little, little bit of the kidney with uh, uh, exertion, but really uh, functionally, despite this massive inflammatory process in the lungs, they are okay. So the, does it make a difference to you on the DMT side? Sort of the... It's really the function. Yeah, it's the function. And then for this patient, you know, we had a ICU pre-consultation with the family and we had in uh, private conversations with the ICU about ECMO candidacy if this happened if decompensation got so bad. Um, but I, it's the first time in my life I've ever done that. Um, the, um, um, but, and, and basically we got lucky. Um, and so I, uh, it's very hard to say what your cut point is for lung function um, pre-transplant when the lung is the target organ. It's easy for us when it's lung function and they've had leukemia treatment or they've got chronic bronchiectatic lung disease. You know, we can we know where to cut it. But 
with something um, with inflammatory lung and this protonosis process, which looks like that part of it's reversible, it's harder to you know hit um, to be dogmatic. From a logistics standpoint, did any of you have issues with with um, insurer approval of transplant? No, I, I live in Canada. They don't approve anything there. <laughs> <laughs> you can get anything you need for anyone in Canada, but you don't get more than you need. That's the difference in the United uh, States. And this is not a unique problem for patients. Um, you know, there are other patients with inborn errors of immunity and other problems that you don't necessarily have a genetic diagnosis for. And typically, you know, you write a very nice letter to the insurance company that goes as part of the whole transplant packet. So like at our center, you know, there's a whole contract negotiated between our center and the insurance company. And so the letter goes and every now and then you might have to have a phone call with someone just to sort of better explain, you know, the reason for the transplant. Um, but typically it's not a barrier. All right. So I'm going to take one more question and I think uh, we'll, we'll wrap up this session with a, a call to action for all the people whose faces you see on the screen. So, um, so Dr. Escala asks about... Um, not lung, but liver disease in, in chronic systemic GI, which was a theme that came up earlier. Um, any alterations in, in conditioning in someone who uh, has, has substantial liver disease? Yep. <laughs> That's probably, yeah, I figured as much. Um, yeah, we would not use um, sulfon, for example. But we, yeah, we would in any way because we use only reduced toxicity conditioning. But I can see the ones that use haplo transplants, they use bisulfan as part of the condition. So I think they would avoid using that. So one of the um, not so subtle subtexts here, and it's, it's come out in the chat a little bit, is to try to garner interest and support on a case series of, you know, allo transplant. Uh, particularly in patients with uh, systemic J lung disease. And so I hope those of you on this call have an ambitious fellow or something in the works who uh, wants to work on um, herding these cats into a manuscript that will be helpful to uh, patients trying to make these decisions and the uh, physicians trying to advise them. Um, so I will first thank Rashmi and, and Luciana for really pushing this session as something that probably doesn't come up enough in our discussions about refractory systemic GIA. Um, and heartened to hear that there's so many centers with uh, not just this level of experience, but this level of expertise and interest. Um, and so, and then finally, of course, to thank our, our many panelists for um, the hard work they've done on behalf of their patients, uh, as well as the hard work they've done in preparing for this session. So, you know, Zoom clap for all of them.